Thank you, uh, Eduardo, for that kind uh, introduction. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, excellent and very thought-provoking forum. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. And um, I was asked to, to be involved in this session on science for health, ensuring universal access uh, to health. And as I'm the co-chair of the Inter Academy Medical Panel, I thought that I would focus uh, more on the role of scientists and the role of the Inter Academy Medical Panel in ensuring universal access for health. Um, I don't have a controller. Can you have the next slide? Well, I think we, we, we all agree with the premise that science is most meaningful when it deals with people and when it benefits people. And we have to find a balance and understand what are people's needs and how science solves um, people's needs. So science have always got to keep a focus on needs of people and whether what we do is relevant. I, since I come from the East, I come from Malaysia, and my background, my family background is Chinese. I'd like to share with you perhaps this three wise men from Chinese um, culture. And they, encom they encompass what many people believe are people's needs, the essentials of a good life. What do people okay. need? So basically, the three wise men... Um, connote three things. First, the wise man there that's carrying a baby, and sometimes men do carry babies, um, is, to, is, to, is to show that one of the needs of people is a home and society, a place to raise their family, have friends, have harmony, enjoy friends, and so on. And the, the other wise man at the other corner, you see the old man with a stick, and he's very happy. And that encompasses that is to symbolize longevity, and longevity is linked to good health. And we have talked about all that yesterday, about food security, water, sanitation, healthy environment, and today, today's forum, this morning's forum is on, on uh, the health services as sustaining health for people so that they can enjoy this concept of longevity and good health. And of course, the third wise man, the one in the middle, and is to symbolize wealth and prosperity. And therefore, we were talking about poverty eradication. Of course, that's the first step. So that people have enough money, enough resources to enjoy quality of life, societal progress, and so on. We would think that what has science done towards achieving the ideas of what people need? All right? People need harmony, they need security, they need longevity, they need good health, they need some amount of wealth. What has science done? If you look at the achievements of the 20th century, you will find that the infusion of science into education and into medical practice so that what we learn about the world around us and what we do as medical practitioners in treating patients are now today evidence-based. It's based on scientific knowledge and scientific concept. And also science has contributed a lot towards innovation that has solved a lot of problems in society. Although yesterday we talked about many of the problems of water, food and so on. Nevertheless, in that last century, there has been a lot of good developments, all right? There's pipe water to a, f a fair amount of the population. There's much better food than the century before. There have been good transport. Well, there's still problems, of course. And in the area of medicine, there have been new developments in surgery, in drugs, in vaccines, in diagnostics, and so on. And also in the behavior of people, professionalism, training, accreditation, standards, ethics, have all creeped into the way we practice. So you can say that from in the 20th century, it has actually 
led to a doubling of human lifespan. So you can say science must have done quite a lot if the lifespan of people have increased twice. Considering at the beginning of the century, most people live only about 30, 40 years. Uh, by the end of the 20th century, the expected lifespan is about 70 or more years. So that's a fairly big contribution. And we could perhaps sit and pat ourselves on the back and say science have done a lot. So, but when we look at the 21st century, we realize that the world is still far from well. We live in an unequal world. If you look at that map of the world drawn according to the burden of disease, you'll notice that it looks very different from the map that we are used to. You find that Africa is very fat. It has more burden than is expected. And there are many gaps in inequalities in health in that many countries in the world today still do not benefit from the advances that have been made in the 20th century. Poor and developing countries are left behind. And if you talk about the ability to deal with problems of their own country through medical and health research, we, we realize that there's a 1090 gap. Only 10% of global spending on health research is devoted to diseases or conditions that account for 90% of the global disease burden. So there is a gross disparity. At the back, if I put up my hand, yeah, okay. So inequalities in health, workforce, uh, distribution by WHO region, if you look at this graph, you will see that Africa, for example, has the largest percentage of global burden of disease, yet it has the lowest percentage of global workforce. So there is a gross disparity. If you look at that map again, redrawn according to the qualities we're talking about, burden of disease, Africa's the fattest. When you talk about the workforce to deal with the burden of disease, Africa looks really out of shape. It's really skinny. So these are just a pictorial idea of the inequalities in the health workforce that's available. And if you look at the research capacity of the low and middle income countries to deal with their own problems, including health problems, um, there is a huge lag uh, between the lower middle income countries compared to the high income countries. You can see that this group of the high income countries, the low middle income countries lag far behind. And the resources that are available to support creative investigation express as a percentage of the gross domestic uh, expenditure, as a percentage of GDP. You'll notice that for the more advanced countries, they spend about 3% to 4% of the GDP, whereas in the developing world, certainly nowhere near that. For Malaysia, we've only just managed 1% recently. There is a smaller pool of quality researchers to deal with their problems and there's on top of that a brain drain from the under-resourced to the high-income countries as well as within their own communities. So there, there is a major issue there. And as a result, uh, well this is not the only reason why that is so, but certainly if you look at life expectancy by income group countries, you notice that the high income countries have enjoyed a much better life expectancy, whether it be male or female, compared to the low income countries. So we live in an unequal world, how do we say that we've achieved a lot in the 20th century. So we've led to this concept of universal health coverage, which is one of the proposed sustainable development goals, one, some, one of the targets, I think it's in the third goal. And what does universal health coverage do? There are many definitions, I'll just take a very simple one, that by the concept of universal health coverage, we're talking about delivering health to the entire population of a country, um, so that the entire population has access to the needed health services and the services should be of sufficient quality to be effective while at the same time ensuring that people do not suffer financial hardship when paying for these services. So basically there are two components to it. One is that they should be able to have access, the whole population, 
or nearly the whole population, but by right, by definition, it should be the whole population, have access to effective health care and it, they should have financial risk protection so that they do not suffer a catastrophic loss of income or resources when they need health care. So the first area is universal access to health care. That's basically what this morning's forum is about. And when we look at that, there are many angles to it. Firstly, to have access to health care that is sufficient for the needs of a population, there must be sufficient human expertise and technical resources available. So there should be enough hospitals, enough doctors, enough um, services that deal with the kind of problems that people in that society or that country um, require. So there has to be an appropriate comprehensive package of the essential services. This could be curative, like medical, surgical, rehabilitative or diagnostic services, but they should also be preventive, like vaccinations, checkups and so on, and promotive, to promote good health rather than uh, to promote good lifestyle and so on. And uh, I won't dwell into great details on that because I think WHO Show has done a lot of work on this and Gary would be able to expand on this later. It has been shown that um, there are better health outcomes when these packages are built on the primary health care um, delivery rather than on uh, the tertiary delivery. But on top of that, you may have good expertise and technical resources, but if the people cannot reach them, then it is not available to them. So you need a suitable social infrastructure. You need roads, you need transport, you need the ability to get to those uh, healthcare facilities. And of course, the third is that of justice. There must be no discrimination. The services must be available to everybody. It shouldn't be not available to some because of income or gender or ethnic background or religion or whatever. All right? So these are very fundamental concepts of universal uh, access to health. The second angle is that of financial risk protection for health. And uh, many communities talk about financing through taxation and through the tax provide the services or else they have um, universal insurance, which may or may not be uh, based on legislation or made mandatory. And uh, certainly, the, the thinking is that publicly funded healthcare services is fairer and more all-encompassing than to have a lot of out-of-pocket spending on healthcare, which then lead to catastrophic household health costs. So they pay for... Uh, for a difficult uh, health problem, people have to end up selling their homes and so on to pay for it. It is not so simple, of course, because when you talk about universal health care, you've got to talk about what to, do you cover in the package. Uh, there has to be a determination of the health care package that is the entitlement of all in that community or all in that country. Excuse me. And this package may vary with countries. Is it fair that it should vary with countries? Or is there, should there be a global package of essential services that all countries should strive for? This has not yet been settled. I think many countries still need to sit down and discuss as to what do they consider the essential services that should be available to all citizens of a particular country. And of course, most of the time you talk about essential package, then you do not talk about rare diseases or high cost diseases, but what do you do about them when a person does have a rare disease and a person does have a very high cost disease? How would this be covered so that it that again does not need, need to catastrophic health costs to these people. So there are many questions that still need to be answered. If you look at this map here, of course it's 2009, uh, but this is the most common uh, map that's often used to talk about global prevalence of universal health uh, coverage, you find that many countries have not yet achieved 
health coverage to literally 100% or at least 90% of the population. You may be surprised that US is not covered there yet, but it is because the health insurance coverage for 90% of the population would be achieved only this year. So I'm sure that has, and I've just highlighted Malaysia, we're down there. We claim that we have universal health coverage, but I think that can be debated. Um, as we look at universal health, what is the access to good health in a country? We realize that it is not just the medical services that's available that matters. There is, I think, a very good study that's already done and very well quoted, commissioned by the World Health Organization on the social determinants of health, chaired by Sir Ma Michael Marmot of the UK. And the findings of that are very important. It shows that in all countries, at all levels of income, whether you're a high-income country or low-income country, health and illness follow a social gradient. The lower the socioeconomic position of a person, the worse the health. And this is significantly affected by economic and the political system of a country. And the statement from WHO summarizes it. The science shows that social factors account for the bulk of global burden of disease and of health inequalities between countries and within countries. And this um, very nice diagram here shows the individual health and all the social factors that affect the individual's health, the physical environment, their housing, the food, the air, the water quality, the social determinants, um, what kind of services they have, the social environment, and, and so on, uh, the wealth, uh, the economic environment, and so on. And basically, there are three principles from that commission. On top of recognizing that there are social determinants of health around us, we realize that there are some very unique 21st century challenges that are facing the world today in the area of health and social conditions. Uh, these are very multifaceted, they're intertwined, they're rapidly changing, and I like to look at them in three ways. Firstly, the healthcare systems and the practices, the medical practices we have today. The ability of communities and countries to cope with extreme changes that occur, unpredicted changes that occur. And of course, societal dynamics and demographics that are rapidly changing all the time. They pose unique challenges of this century. Firstly, the complex health systems. The kind of health care practices that occur this century are very different from the last century. There's a huge rising cost and demands because of an explosion of knowledge regarding diseases and their patterns. Uh, the, the kind of treatment that is instated is very often so super specialized. We're talking about targeted therapy, personalized medicine, all of which are extremely expensive. So the treatment of a cancer patient today is very targeted compared to previously when you talk about you know, a fairly universal set of drugs. Today it is very specific to each particular cancer. There are also socially very diverse type of patients. There are some that are extremely knowledgeable and demanding, and there are still some that are very trusting and, pre and prefer the doctor to take a a paternal approach to them. Uh, basically, because of that, there's an unprecedented teamwork required for healthcare. It is very unlikely that any one patient with a serious disease would be treated by just one doctor. He would have a whole team of people looking after him, all right? Of a doctor, surgeon, oncologist, radiologist, pathologist, nurses, rehabilitation, phys you know, physiotherapists, everybody. That's a huge demand for that. And all these have to work in a team so that each can complement each other. So that needs a lot more organization, a lot more understanding of each other and working together. And there is a lot more demands on the healthcare financing system. So the system itself is changing rapidly and get becoming more and more difficult. On the other hand, there are arising within the healthcare system 
its own threats, and I'm just naming one, and that is antimicrobial resistance. We talk about intensive care and so on, and we think that's pretty good. We can look after patients that are very, very sick and still get them home. But we have now today the superbug that has come. Antimicrobial resistance poses a catastrophic threat. Uh, this is announced by the UK uh, chief medical officer. This has gone all over the world. In my hospital last year, the superbug arrived. And our intensive care now has a superbug that is totally resistant to any kind of antibiotic. And it's related to the way we practice. What kind of antibiotic usage, policies, the use of antibiotics in industry and agriculture. We are soon entering into the pre-antibiotic era where all the antibiotics we have will be ineffective against these resistant drugs. And if you see a patient with such drugs, we actually have no antibiotics to use. And science have not invested much in developing new antibiotics because there's not much money to be made from antibiotics. There's more money to be made from chronic disease therapy. Whereas antibiotics you use for a week and so uh, you don't make much money for it. So I think science have to address this issue of uh, developing new antibiotics and also science, medical science has to develop the policies for making sure that we use antibiotics properly and not develop resistant organisms. So this is again unique to this century. We know that talking about access to healthcare and testing for genetic factors to know who is going to be susceptible to disease actually addresses only about 30% of causes of premature mortality. If you talk about people dying ahead of their expected lifespan, dying before the age of 60, 70% of the reasons why people die before the age of 60 is due to environmental factors or behavioral factors. So I'd like to just quickly look at some 21st century issues on environmental and, is and behavioral factors. Of course, we know about climate change. We talked a lot about that yesterday. But uh, it is important to realize that greenhouse gas emissions link to chronic disease is quite well shown by science. If we can mitigate climate change in a high-income area like London, you can reduce heart disease and stroke by 20% and breast cancer by at least 10, 15%, well, 12%. And in Delhi, a low-income area, the same thing. You can cut the burden of heart disease and strokes and diabetes just by mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, we are aware that climate change leads to environmental disasters, disease outbreak, we have had in Malaysia our big um, lesson learned from the Nipah virus outbreak that was devastating to our economy. The recent um, Ebola outbreak I can tell us also about issues of uh, One Health and how disease can spread from uh, wildlife into human life, the zoonotic diseases. We know that when there's environmental disasters like tsunamis and earthquakes and so on, there is always a disease outbreak and catastrophic losses to communities. And the, the link of climate change to many of these, I think there is uh, more than enough scientific evidence. I like, however, to remind ourselves that the issue of One Health may not be so well recognized by the scientific community in many countries, but this is something that IMP is also committed to, and that is to call upon more dialogue between veterinary, agricultural scientists and medical scientists to sit together so that you have a proper surveillance system to know that when there is change, when there are changes occurring in agriculture, or in wildlife, uh, this may very often spread into human life. There are many angles to it, I won't belabor it, but certainly veterinary medicine, um, vector-borne diseases, bio-threats affect individual health of people, the ecosystem and the way we manage it affect the migration of uh, 
fruit bats that carry disease into farms and so on, which then lead to infection of domestic animals as well as to human beings. And very often these are viruses that we may not have encountered before, so there may be new viral outbreaks or there may be re-emergence of viruses that have been dormant for a while. And they again lead to catastrophic threats to the human population. We know, of course, that with rapid and mass global travel of recent years, uh, decades, that disease outbreaks spread very fast. What happens in one corner of the world will rapidly affect the rest of the world. And also today's societies in most countries are now very cosmopolitan. So when we train medical students, certainly in Malaysia, we're not talking about only Malaysian type of disease because we know that we will have visitors from other countries that will come with uh, disease patterns that belong there. And that's true for everywhere. All right? This is already a very common phenomenon and we have to be aware of this. Of course, we know about urbanization. Uh, since 2007, half of the world's population is urban and by 2030, 60% uh, will be urban, and urban societies and megacities have their own health problems. And to ensure universal access to people in, in megacities is another big uh, challenge that is unique to this century. There's a lot of isolation of disabled people, elderly people in megacities because they cannot cope with the complexities of a megacity. And they may not have access to health, even though the megacity is very well developed. There are, of course, some other unique problems, mental health, adolescent problems, crime, and so on, which affect health of people, injuries to people, and uh, require then health care to address that. Besides that, urbanization is an underlying driver towards something known as the non-communicable disease, diseases, of which heart disease, diabetes, and cancer are the most common. And if we think that this is a problem only of high-income countries, that is not true. The low- and middle-income countries are going to be the place where we're going to have the highest number of premature deaths from non-communicable disease before the age of 60. And of course, we know that the population is aging, and the aged people need healthcare utilization a lot more. This is the data from Malaysia itself. We are a young population, but we are already beginning to see uh, in the last uh, decade or so the increase in utilization of health services by the elderly people. So, what does the Inter Academy Medical Panel do? So, in the next uh, five minutes or so, I try to finish off because I think I, we started late. This is a global network of um, the world's medical academies and medical sectors of uh, academies of science and engineering. There are 74 members. We basically commit to improving health worldwide through building scientific capacity for health as well as provide independent evidence-based scientific advice. Uh, to governments on health issues. And basically what the Inter-Academy Medical Band stands on is that scientists wear many hats. We can influence, in a sense, the world in many ways. For example, we can influence through research capacity strengthening. You can say, what has that to, go to do with um, universal access to, to health? But to develop the kind of expertise needed, and to tackle the health problems of today needs research. And the low-income countries that have low research capacity will not be able to deliver because they will not be able to develop the kind of expertise needed, the diagnostic ability, the treatment expertise, and so on. And scientists can be key players in this by research capacity building. I won't go into the, the fine details of the ways whereby research capacity can be built. I think many of us are involved institutions that are involved in this, whether it be training or partnerships and pairing and sandwich PhDs and so on. There are also um, global collaborations that can, can be forged through networks for capacity building in low-income countries to develop the kind of uh, uh, medical 
expertise, whether it be in surgery or oncology or diagnostics that, are, that can be done. And this is just one, uh, some pictures here that show a capacity building uh, um, activity initiative in Sudan, and this is the one in Myanmar. Um, the Inter-Academy Medical Panel has done some, a, a few very unique initiatives that I'd like to share. One of them is regard tackling uh, the training of medical health professionals so that they're able to cope with the changing world. And this is based on um, a Lancet Commission report on health professionals for a new century transforming the education system for an independent world. This commissioned report was launched in 2010 in December and the um, Inter-Academy Medical Panel was uh, invited by the China Medical Board, uh, this is a Gates-funded uh, project, uh, to disseminate the concepts of this uh, commission. And uh, we have been running or initiating uh, discussions on this through the network of um, academies. And basically the concept is to work towards a transformative kind of learning where the health professionals that are trained or uh, um, educated through the present healthcare system should develop abilities to, um, to change, to, to cope with the changing world. And others transformative learning abilities and leadership attributes, all right? And uh, this is just one workshop, for example, that was done in Malaysia, where we, we d discussed this commission report. And there were also other discussions in Sri Lanka, in Nepal, India, and so on. Um, taking this a bit further, the IMP has a unique program known as the Young Physician Leaders Program, which tries to foster a new generation of leaders in global health for the 21st century. And it really runs workshops every year since 2011. It's a fairly new initiative. In conjunction with the health, World Health Summit in Berlin, we develop, we pick about 20 young physician leaders to train through, uh, in leadership qualities uh, every year and develop a critical mass of young physicians who are then form a network among themselves and uh, also challenge their member academies to support and strengthen their leadership skill. Now we have trained about 108 young physician leaders, which has formed a very dynamic, uh, dynamic network. Of course, the work of uh, Inter-Academy Medical Panel is advisory as well as advocacy. We have issued statements on the health co-benefits of policies to tackle climate change. We endorsed the G8 statement on water and health. We have called for action on strengthening uh, health research capacity. We have worked with the World Health Summit to talk about progress. We have called on action for antimicrobial resistance. And more recently, we have signed the endorsement of the One Health approach. And we run uh, workshops. We have had workshops in Brazil here on uh, non-communicable diseases, workshops on uh, conferences on mental health, and more recently in Trieste, a workshop on uh, promoting action on the social determinants of health, calling for action by governments to address um, health uh, through addressing the social determinants. And and uh, this, is, this is an area to remind ourselves not to forget about sustainable health, that there should be preventive and promotive actions. I'd just like to share this from Joe Buford, the previous co-chair of IMP, on some of the actions that were taken in New York, where you use a legislative approach to uh, smoking prevention, and you can find that step by step, it is possible to bring down the percentage of people smoking Promoting physical activity to maintain good health requires interaction with town planners and others, other scientists in society. Promoting access to fresh fruits and vegetables uh, to, to bring good food to the community. Media messages to cut down on trans oil and sugary drinks. And you'll find that it does work. Uh, less people use sugary drinks. And basically, 
The, the next step, I think, is to focus on global collaboration. We think that um, academy can work by itself or individual scientists can work by itself. It probably is not sufficient. The, um, the, the last 20 years have seen a big change in the landscape of global collaboration uh, in that the Millennium Development Goals is a good example where nations get together to discuss about a global um, joint action, a global fund to fight AIDS, TB, Gavi, uh, Alliance, and so on. And uh, I feel that global collaborations can make a difference. So now if we talk about the, the sustainable development goals, I think we should also think in terms of how uh, collaborations can, can work towards achieving this. The selling point I'd like to end with is that you cannot tackle hunger, disease, poverty unless you can also provide people with a healthy ecosystem. So we talk to our governments, we have to push the point that health is going to be very important. And uh, the investing in health, if you look at this latest uh, Lancet Commission report in December of, uh, of last year, it has been shown that for the low and middle income countries, uh, between 2000 and 2011, 24% of growth in the income has actually resulted from health improvements. So this is an important message to bring to government if we want them to sit up and look at investing in health. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.